Good to have you with us. I'm Daniel Che, who with the latest at this hour. President Bakunhe has named a new presidential press secretary after a close aide stepped down from the post. The presidential office of Chong Ade on Sunday said Yun Du Hyun was tapped as the new secretary. He was noted for his balanced way of thinking and keen analytical skills as a journalist. Yun spent most of his career at YTN, a 24 hour news channel, where he served as the head of the political bureau. The head of YTN Plus, an online and mobile news content provider, and also as the newsroom director. Earlier, President Park accepted the resignation of former press secretary Yi Jung Hyun, signaling that a much anticipated reshuffle within the presidential office and cabinet is imminent. Another body has been pulled from the Sankan Seoro ferry 54 days after the disaster that killed nearly 300 in April. The government's disaster response headquarters said Sunday it had found the body of a female in the third floor cafeteria of the vessel at around 10.35 in the morning. The headquarters will conduct DNA tests and a fingerprint identification after the body is brought to land. Rescue personnel had been searching the area based on testimony given by crew members during the ongoing investigation into the disaster. The discovery brings the number of missing passengers to 13 and the death toll to 291. The ferry disaster is also taking a toll on the Korean economy, denting domestic demand and prompting the government to consider lowering its growth outlook for this year. Our Connie Kim reports. With April's deadly ferry disaster affecting the whole nation, the government is reviewing whether to adjust the economic growth outlook for this year. The finance ministry said Sunday that it's assessing economic activity in the first half of the year as it reviews its predictions for the latter half. The ministry is planning to release its economic policy direction for the second half of the year later this month. The ministry says that its policies will focus on supporting the service sector and small businesses in light of the Seoul ferry disaster. Now, the ministry's plans are expected to include tax breaks and employment subsidies, though the amount of support has not yet been determined. The ministry says the measures will be geared toward boosting domestic demand and improving people's livelihoods. The government last year predicted a growth rate of 3.9 percent for this year. However, a state-run research institute says it is highly unlikely the government can achieve that due to sluggish domestic consumption. Last month, the Korea Development Institute, a government think tank, lowered its growth forecast to 3.7 percent. Connie Kim, Arirang News. On a more somber note, another Korean comfort woman has passed away. Pe Chun Hee died at the age of 91, according to the House of Sharing on Sunday. The group runs a shelter for women who were forced into sexual slavery for the Japanese military during World War II. Pe's death leaves only 54 surviving victims in the country. Initially, there were 237 women on the list of government-registered former sex slaves. Historians estimate that up to 200,000 comfort women, mostly from Korea and China, were forced into sexual slavery during World War II. Korea has been urging Tokyo to apologize to and compensate the victims. But Japan says that the issue was resolved through a 1965 treaty that normalized bilateral ties between the two countries. And demonstrating how quickly Japan works when they put their mind to it, Japan has presented North Korea with a list of roughly 470 Japanese nationals it believes were abducted by Pyongyang. In a television appearance Sunday, Japan's chief cabinet secretary Yoshihide Suga said the list had been sent to Pyongyang through a diplomatic channel. The move is part of a recent agreement under which Pyongyang will reinvestigate the whereabouts of missing Japanese nationals in exchange for sanctions relief. Suga said Tokyo will send officials to North Korea after the reinvestigation to verify the results. He added Tokyo would continue intergovernmental talks with Pyongyang on the abduction issue even if North Korea carries out nuclear tests or launches missiles. An American researcher has urged Korea, the U.S., and China to engage in trilateral talks on Korean reunification. 
Our Kim Hyun Bin has more on a provocative suggestion she had about the U.S. troop presence on the peninsula. Sumi Terry, a senior researcher with the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University, says that South Korea, the U.S., and China need to engage in active discussion on the future of reunified Korea. Terry, a former director of Korea, Japan, and Oceanic Affairs at the National Security Council, made the remarks at a congressional hearing last week. Terry said that in order to change China's policy on North Korea, Seoul and Washington need to convince Beijing that Korean reunification will be beneficial for the country. She added that the U.S. needs to promise not to dispatch its troops north of the border after reunification is achieved. She also went as far as to say that the U.S. should consider pulling its troops out of Korea entirely to win Beijing's support, saying that this would ease China's security concerns and could encourage Beijing to put more pressure on North Korea. She said the move would not be a diplomatic policy failure for Washington, as U.S. troops were first stationed on the peninsula to defend South Korea after the Korean War. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Petro Poroshenko, a pro-European billionaire confectioner, was sworn in as the fifth president of Ukraine on Saturday. In his inaugural speech, he made it clear that he would not give up on Crimea nor compromise on Ukraine's push for closer ties with Europe. The 48-year-old chocolate king stressed the need for a united Ukraine and the urgency of ending the conflict that threatens to further split the country. He added he would sign the economic part of an association deal with the European Union as a step towards full membership. And in what could be a positive signal from Moscow, Russian news agencies reported that President Vladimir Putin ordered the Federal Security Service to strengthen protection of the border with Ukraine and prevent people crossing illegally. Ukraine and Western governments have been pressing Moscow to stop what they saw, what they say rather, is a flow of Russian arms and fighters into eastern Ukraine. A wave of car bombs exploded across Baghdad on Saturday, killing more than 60 people. There were a dozen blasts in the mainly Shiite districts of the capital, the deadliest of which occurred in Baya, where one bomb took more than 23 lives. Other bombs went off near a cinema, a popular juice shop, and a Shiite mosque. No group immediately claimed responsibility for any of the bombings, but the Shiite community is a frequent target for Sunni Islamist insurgents. And in related news, the bodies of 21 policemen who were executed by militants were found in the northern city of Mosul, as fierce fighting continues in that area. Iraq is experiencing some of its worst violence in recent years, and last year the country saw its highest annual death toll in years. The destruction of natural environment is not only diminishing the amount of biological diversity around the globe, it is also wreaking havoc with the languages of the world. A study reported on The Guardian on Sunday shows a direct link between the destruction of habitats and the extinction of indigenous languages. A quarter of the world's remaining 7,000 languages are at risk of becoming extinct. And about 30 percent of the world's languages have become extinct since the 1970s, according to the study. New Guinea, the world's second largest island, is one place where indigenous languages are under threat. It was once an island where more than a thousand languages were spoken, but more than half of the languages have been lost due to rapid development. Installing solar panels can make a home more energy efficient, but the setup costs can make the move unaffordable for many homeowners. Local companies have come up with an easy way to lease out the equipment even to those who cannot afford the initial investment. Our Son jung -in has more. From the bright lights in the living room to the air conditioner and TV, all these home appliances are running on energy provided from a solar panel on the roof of the house. But the installation doesn't come cheap, with an average cost of seven to eight thousand U.S. dollars. In order to lessen the burden for homeowners, solar companies came up with so-called solar panel rental program. Under the lease agreement, they can borrow the equipment for under seventy dollars a month. Last summer, we ran the air conditioner all season, and the monthly electricity bill came to around $1,000. But after we installed the solar panel, we are now paying just one-fifth of the usual bill. 
The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy says homeowners that pay an average $100 for electricity a month can save up to $15 every month, even after paying the rental and electricity fees. If you sign up for the sunlight panel rental service, we set the facility up for free. The rental period covers the costs of any repairs and maintenance so you can save more money. Only non-apartment building houses that are well insulated and are not facing the south are currently eligible for the service. The government plans to promote ways for the one and a half million houses qualified to benefit from the lease program so they can save both the planet and money. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And now the weather. It's been a cloudy Sunday in most parts of Korea and looks like those conditions will continue on Monday. And now let's take a look at the weather conditions in other parts of our world. That's all we could squeeze into this hour. Thank you for watching and have a great start to your week.